Now, as you listeners already know, I have strong opinions about Amazon. I have strong opinions about the new deal Amazon just signed with Long Island City, Queens, and with Northern Virginia. My next guest is uh, an ex excellent resource on the issue of what Amazon is up to, and um, I look forward to speaking with, with her about it. Stacy Mitchell is co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. She also directs its Community Scaled Economy Initiative, which produces a lot of research and analysis. She's been tracking the Amazon uh, headquarters issue for quite a while. Uh, she's also been tra tracking the retail and banking sectors. She wrote a book entitled Big Box Swindle, The True Cost of Mega Retailers and the Fight for America's Independent Businesses. And she has recently released uh, or co-authored a paper on Amazon's stranglehold on the economy. So she joins us now. Stacy Mitchell, thanks so much for coming on the Zero Hour. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I have to, uh, you've done a lot of great research in this area. I have to admit my initial response to the announcement of this deal was uh, a lot of anger. And uh, the anger stemmed from a couple things, but one is I, I felt almost from the beginning, I, I've tracked Amazon for a while. I'm not, not as closely as you have, but enough to feel that from the very beginning, I, I thought this entire so-called HQ2 search was a charade of some kind that they were they my personal feeling is that they probably already knew what they wanted to do where they wanted to put their additional offices that there, there was going to be no magic uh um you know bullet for one local economy that they just wanted to go out there and see how desperate local economies uh how much they would be willing to give them so that they could go back to wherever they plan to go anyway this is my theorizing of course and extract as much in the way of concessions as they possibly could uh do you think i'm completely off base partly off base what i think you are right i mean we don't know for sure but i think a lot of people who've been following this closely myself included uh, believe very much that this was a foregone conclusion. And Amazon knew that it was ultimately going to expand in the nation's capital and in New York. I mean, we should note that these are two places that Amazon already has uh, facilities and employees. In fact, they're the second and third largest location for Amazon's workforce outside of Seattle. Um, these are places where Jeff Bezos, uh, the Amazon CEO, has homes uh, and spends a lot of time. So I don't think it's any surprise at all that Amazon has chosen these locations. Uh, I think this is a company that wants to take a lot of, of power over the economy and I think situating itself near government power and near financial and media power are a, a strategic move that the company is making. Uh, and I think this whole thing has been uh, really a ruse. Uh, Amazon's gotten a lot out of it, but it's been really harmful uh, to the nation's cities. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I also think, by the way, I thought it was a tawdry, desperate and sad spectacle to see how how much our, our cities and states are really reduced to begging from what I would describe as an oligarchical figure and his company and, and the sort of desperate attempts at wooing. Um, it says to me that there is something fundamentally off in terms of the inequality in our economy and in terms of the distortion of power in our political economy. To me, when we have one person in Jeff Bezos, who's the wealthiest man in America, having all sorts of flattery and begging and money thrown at him and his company in the hope against hope that they might do something for a local uh, economy. That's right. I mean, who who is in charge of this country? I mean, I think that's a question that we need to ask because it really doesn't feel like we're in charge. Um, you know, a lot of the bids, you know, there were 238 cities that got in the bidding on the first round and then 20 in the finalist round. A lot of that process was uh, kept secret. You know, certainly the 20 finalists, they had to, to sign non-disclosure agreements with Amazon. Uh, we don't know, uh, you know, in many cases what these cities offered. We don't know what kind of information and data 
they gave to Amazon. And when we look back at this, we have to, you know, I think what Amazon got out of this were a number of incredibly valuable things that we as a public handed over to it. I mean, one, it got city leaders all over the country singing its praises, you know, um, talking about how great it would be if Amazon grew and came to their cities. Um, and that in the, in the context of a moment when Amazon was coming under increased scrutiny for its, its economic power and its sort of growing monopoly over e-commerce and other parts of our economy, when people were starting to look at that and say, hey, wait a second, is this too much power for one company to have? You know, should we be looking at our antitrust laws? You know, as that conversation was starting, uh, Amazon engineered this stunt where it had you know, all of these officials across the country, uh, you know, talking it up, praising it, uh, this big public relations bonanza that came out of it. Um, and then the other things that Amazon got out of this by, by having this process, instead of just announcing a year and a half ago, we're going to expand in New York and DC, but by having this contest, they upped the bits. I mean, they made cities have to put uh, billions of dollars in public subsidies on the table uh, in order to compete in this contest. And it looks like uh, at least three billion, maybe more than four billion by some estimates now as people begin to tally up what New York and Virginia have offered big, big dollars that are that are going to go straight to, to, to Amazon. And then the third thing that Amazon got out of having this contest is that 238 cities across the country uh, gathered up and handed Amazon a lot of valuable data mm. about land use patterns, future infrastructure directions, um, information that, you know, in a lot of times, is, you know, is not public. We don't, you know, other companies don't have access to it. I mean, wouldn't you like to know if you were a big growing company um, about what's happening at a very granular level so that you can figure out where's the right place to site a facility? How can I use this data to get an edge over my competitors? Um, you know, this is, this is watching our government abet a, a monopoly. You know, you made uh, multiple great points there, Stacey Mitchell, and, and I, I want to I want to emphasize uh, a couple of them. One, the point that we are uh, at a historical moment where finally, thank God, uh, people are, are are pushing back on the monopoly power of corporations like Amazon. Amazon. The point that you made that they've used this exercise in order to get political figures from across the country to sing their praises is a terrific one. Um, the concessions we kind of, you know, we knew about, but also very important. And then the data piece of it, given that all of these companies are in the data mining, extraction, and manipulation usage business it, it is also terrific. And I, I think there's one other dimension of this, which I addressed in, 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 when I wrote about it, but I'd love your thoughts on um, you know, I, point, I pointed out in the piece that I just wrote about it that Bezos, if his, uh, Jeff Bezos, if his income, if he's earning money at the same rate this year as he was last year, it's a little more than $96 million per day. Uh, the $5 million, for example, that Amazon promised to put into training local people in Long Island City, Queens, is about as much as Jeff earns in 20 minutes. Um, that it, even the money that was offered, the 500 million in concessions on uh, uh, or actual grants for for buildings, it takes Jeff a little more than five days to make that money. Even the entire uh, Good Jobs First estimates that the actual worth of the New York bid is 2.8 billion dollars. Well, Jeff Bezos can make that in less than a month. So I guess what I was thinking about all of this is that it's not just about the money, although they got tremendous money, but by showing, by making New York City and New York State grovel like this, they're really establishing the tone of a relationship because it's my personal belief that when Amazon violates labor laws or violates environmental regulations or does something else. They want to have established through this process, they want to have disciplined, if you will, the city and state to understand that when it's time to fall in line, they better fall in line. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's, a, I think you're absolutely right about that. I mean, I, you know, we have to, you know, we have to understand Amazon as a company that is really seeking to be a governing force. 
You know, when, it, when you look at the way that Amazon, you know, this is not a company that's simply about dominating markets. Yeah, they're a big retailer. Yeah, they control a third of the world's cloud computing capacity. Yes, they're going after UPS and building out this logistics uh, and, and package delivery infrastructure. I mean, they are going after all of these different markets that they're seeking to dominate. But the better way really to understand Amazon is not in those terms, but that this is a company that wants to control the basic infrastructure of commerce. You know, they want to be able to set the terms of trade um, and they're really becoming a, a gatekeeper, if you will. You know, every other firm that wants to reach consumers online, you know, increasingly those firms have to go through Amazon's platform. And that means that it's no longer a market in the sense of a, a market and a democracy where, you know, we, we the people set the terms for that market, you know, uh, how is it going to operate, who can participate, you know, how are we going to make sure the scales are fair and all of those other questions. Instead, we're talking about trade moving into uh, uh, onto this sort of a privately controlled platform where you have a kind of autocrat that sets the terms by which every other participant, every other company, every other customer uh, gets to play. They get to decide the rules, they get to regulate what goes on, and they get to levy a kind of tax uh, across all of those businesses that rely on their platform or rely on their uh, cloud services and, and so on. So Amazon is, is beginning to take on, uh, to assume for itself, some of the functions that belong to government in a democratic society. And I think what you're getting at is that in the process of doing that, it's also um, shifting the relationship that it has with government and weakening government power uh, in order to further usurp and envelop and, and smother ultimately uh, public authority uh, and assume that authority for itself. I think there's a strong connection um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt back in the 1930s when he really, you know, he created the modern anti-monopoly movement that was sustained in this country uh, up until Ronald Reagan. He broke up a lot of companies. He was really a leader in going after concentrated power. And I think it's really notable that the language that he used, he referred to it as a, a, a monopolies as a form of industrial dictatorship. And I think that word dictatorship is something that we should uh, reflect on in the context of what Amazon is doing. You know, it, it's such a terrifying prospect, um, and, and I hope that, I'm not sure exactly how to advance public awareness on this. Uh, back in 2014, I wrote a piece suggesting that maybe Amazon and Google and some of these other companies needed to be regulated like public utilities, and people thought I was crazy. I feel now that that's too mild, perhaps, that that they are determined to, uh, especially Amazon, to create a level of control that we haven't seen in modern times or perhaps ever because the technology behind it never existed before and that uh, this industrial dictatorship is almost here, is my sense. And we had the case of some European booksellers, for example, who suddenly found themselves uh, out of business because Amazon didn't, or virtually out of business, decided not to handle their used books anymore the same way through its Abe's Booksellers uh, subsidiary and so on. I'm just wondering what the solution is. I feel, you know, regulation, it, do we need to break them up? Is that, uh, what's the answer? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's right. You know, we should we should remember that uh, uh, that while it's true that we have never seen anything quite like Amazon before, and there are ways in which I, you know I've argued that this is a kind of new kind of monopoly. Um, but we should remember that there are antecedents to it, and I think we can draw on some of those examples. You know, back in the 19th century, um, when the railroad came along, you know, a very uh, disruptive technology is, is maybe how we would describe the railroad today. You know, the railroad uh, came along, and initially there were a handful of these powerful industrialists, people like Cornelius Vanderbilt. Um, uh, 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 John D. Rockefeller, who gained control of those rail lines, and they used their control over the rail lines to disadvantage their competitors in other lines of business. Um, so to maintain standard oils uh, lock on the market, they wouldn't let competing uh, oil companies use their rail lines, and they would also use that control over market access 
to extort money from small businesses, from farmers, from sort of ordinary people who needed to get their wares uh, to market via the rail lines. And it was their power that actually led to the first anti-monopoly movement. And we got our first uh, antitrust laws were really in response to the railroads. So we've encountered this before, and that's not the only time. I mean, it comes up, you know, with some regularity in US history. And, you know, we have always, as a people, risen up. Um, and demanded that, you know, a democracy means that we need to disperse power, that we cannot have companies that amass this kind of power. And, it, uh, you know, that that is just absolutely incompatible with a free market, with uh, democracy. So I think the solution to Amazon is that we do need to structurally separate um, its pieces. That, that is, we need to break it up. Um, we need to look at its online platform and recognize that there's an inherent conflict of interest if you uh, operate that platform that other companies depend on and then you are also competing as a retailer and manufacturer on that platform. I think those two things need to be split off. So Amazon as a retailer and manufacturer needs to be a separate company from the platform and the platform needs a, some sort of public public interest oversight so that it's run as a kind of common carrier or maybe a public utility. Uh, but essentially, uh, we recognize that this is essential infrastructure and that everyone needs to have fair access to and that no one entity gets to dominate and use for uh, its own purposes. Well, I think that's a terrific solution and one we should be fighting for. I would also just to add that Amazon and its uh, contractors should also be forced to uh, treat their employees humanely and not in the kind of Dickensian conditions that have been documented in some of their distribution centers. But with all of that, unfortunately, we're out of time. Stacey Mitchell, where can people find out more about your work and the work of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance? Sure, yeah, our website is ILSR, ILSR.org, and if you go to ILSR.org slash Amazon, you'll get straight to all of our Amazon resources as well. Okay, well, you guys are doing great work, and I thank you for that. I also thank you for coming on the program. Thank you.